I have a very important question to ask you. Have you checked out the Generally Spooky Patreon yet? Because if not, why not? We've got oodles of content over there, exclusive episodes only available on Patreon, our wee blethers, the chatty, unscripted weekly show where Kieran and I discuss episodes, what's going on with us, and generally have a great time. There's also the Spooky Book Club, where you'll get a chapter a week of a spooky classic. At the moment, we're in the middle of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, and I am dying to know how it ends. As well as all that goodness, joining our Patreon is really what keeps the podcast going. It allows us to keep doing what we love, which is chatting to all of you about spooky Scottish history. Your £75 a month... No, I'm just kidding. You can pay four eight or twelve pound a month to keep the lights on and keep the creepy cogs turning so come join in search generally spooky patreon or click on the link in our description you're recording are you sure you want to record because it looks a little bit like you're having a breakdown i'm fine (laughs) i'm fine (laughs) don't even worry (laughs) (sighs) hello again everybody good morning afternoon or evening Ah. This is the Generally Spooky podcast. Yes, it is. We're here to bring you everything Scottish history and spooky. Yes. This is episode eight of season four. No, is it? Episode seven of season four. You've made me question it now, you dick. (laughs) (laughs) I actually think this is going to be episode seven and part two is going to be episode eight. This is episode seven of season four. As I said, <laughs> that's why Ailey writes the script. Yeah, yeah, generally. Spooky. Yes, we are bringing you a two-parter. Which An is exciting. unplanned two-parter. I know. We, her Ailey was working on the script and it was long. And it was gearing up to be longer than the Culloden episode. I which is like, three hours and 40 minutes, just under. Yeah. So if, if you're curious. If, yeah, if you haven't chewed your way through that yet don't blame you it's very long but it's really cool badass episode. very proud of it but we were very tired by the end of that <laughs> and we had covid and we had covid <laughs> but the show must go on so we thought we'd bring split to it we thought we'd split today's episode into two parts yes. so they're a bit more accessible for you and we'll be a bit more jazzed like four hours from now <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it's exciting. I'm very proud of this episode. I think it's going to be very varied. Mm. There's lots of different stories in it. Fun. Follows a family history that spans like 800 years. That's good going. It's exciting. It's exciting. You've been very like pumped while you've been... I feel it. ...researching it and writing it. You've been really excited to tell me things, so... I'm jazzed. I'm really jazzed for this one. I'm excited to hear them, as are the listeners, I have to assume. I hope. If they're not, I assume they're not here. <laughs> or they've left already. So bye. Oh, you've already left. Never it was mind. nice having you. <laughs> Do we have any news? I don't remember. Me neither. All of my scripting has pushed all of my news out of my brain. We have Halloween merch. Yes. Very excited for it. Mm-hmm. It's up on the site right now. You can treat yourself to something spooky for spooky season. Mm-hmm. We have hoodies. We have t-shirts. We have tote bags and we have a new beanie design Mm. that has our little tartan ghosty on it. Yes, it does. And the Halloween specific merch is only available, unsurprisingly, until Halloween. Yes. So from November 1st, our Halloween stuff will no longer be available. So if you fancy it, you really need to get in this month Mm -hmm. because it won't be back for at least another year. That's it. When it's gone, it's gone. It's on generallyspooky.com and it's all on the homepage, all the Halloween stuff. So that's grand. Mm-hmm. Well then, shall we roll some music and dive straight in? I think we should because we're going to be here a while. And we've got a lot to get through, so we mm-hmm. should we should really get stuck into it. Yes, here. let's go. Let's go podcast, let's go. <laughs>
<laughs> in my script is quite funny because when I started it, I had no idea how long it was going to be. Because mm. I've been going through it and I've been really like trimming the fat from my research. I'm like, okay, this doesn't have to be in. It's not essential. It goes. So at the start, I've said that this script could potentially be as long as our Mary Queen of Scots episode. And it's it's now easily double that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I had in my head. It's like, oh man, it's going to be really long. It's going to be like that one. It's going to be like 30 pages. Oh my God. <laughs> I think we made the right call to split it. I think so. I think I think everyone's going to enjoy it just a little bit more. And you're just going to have to wait. But it means that you effectively get an extra episode this season, which is fun. I was just about to say, with this being two parts, part two will come out on the following Friday from when part one comes out. But we're still going to do all our original episodes so the podcast is going to run one week longer because we talked about how it's going to end on your birthday yes so the second part of this episode comes out next week yes and then everything else will run as normal so yeah you get an extra episode from us free episode they're not even free. on not even on patreon they're all free free extra episode <laughs> how harsh would that be like part two oh, is on patreon i couldn't do that no i'd be too mean i could not do it <laughs> Well, what are we talking about today? This week, we are going to tackle the long and storied history of Dunrobin Castle. Ooh. And like we've been saying, this is going to be a really long one. So if you want a snack, this is the perfect excuse. Go get a snack Mm -hmm. and get comfy and just chill out for a couple hours with us. Chill out. We have quite a few knitters who listen. Go grab your knitting. Just just settle into it. I wish I could knit while I record this. (laughs) That would be quite satisfying sound, just the click clack in the background. ASMR. <laughs> this feels weird. It's a bit better. So yeah, this one turned out to be more of a history packed episode than I intended it or mm. thought it was going to be. Because when I pick out the topics, I have an idea in my head of sort of the vague feeling of an episode or mm. how it's going to go or the structure I'm going to give it. And I had this down as more of a Black Lady of Lark Hall or Come Long in Castle type episode. Yeah, yeah. And it's just not. The factual history is far more interesting than the ghost stories associated with Dunrobin Castle. Well, that's exciting. And it's interesting because it features on all of the lists across the internet of like top Scottish haunted castles. Oh, yeah? It's on all of them. But the history is way more fascinating. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. So it's it's... Changed my expectations. Mm. Changed into a roller coaster ride through history. It, it really is. It really has been. Do I need my seatbelt on? <laughs> I, I would put it on. Okay. Click. It's a long journey. Lots of twists. <laughs> we had initially planned to visit Dunrobin, but I think we're going to go a different time. And we'll get to it in the next episode. But the family who owned Dunrobin just had a sudden death mm-hmm. and it just felt a bit weird to go i quite agree because you're like you were going to chat to the staff and things and they're obviously all quite upset well a lot of them are grieving yeah it just didn't feel right so we didn't go this time but maybe in the future yes i'll be up for going again another time dunrobin castle is the biggest house or castle in the northern highlands it's quite magnificent if you whip out your phone and look it up it's it's huge pretty glorious castle It's just north of Galsby, and it has a whopping 189 rooms. Oh, my brain... 189 rooms? Yeah, our room, our house has about seven. (laughs) I think. (laughs) This is 189. 189. And yeah, chances are, if you've looked into Scottish history or Scottish castles at all, chances are you've seen Dunrobin Castle. Because it's everywhere. It's one of the most beautiful places to look at. Mm. It's not my favourite place in the world due to the associated history, which we're going to get into uh, next episode. But I can't deny that the building itself is stunning. Yes. Very pretty. Very French looking. It's designed to look like a French chateau. Which is why it it doesn't really fit the traditional Scottish castle look. Mm. But it's been designed that way. It's on purpose. Oh, well, that's good at least. Seems very moneyed when I look at it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I'm just like, whoa, that's someone very wealthy. Because it's so big. Yeah. So big and so grand. But whoo, hello, Mr. Moneybags. <laughs> so what, what makes it muddied? Moneyed. 
Oh, moneyed. I thought I said muddied. Like, oh. did, you didn't know how you felt about it. No, moneyed as in a very wealthy person lives oh, there. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah, right. 100%. It's wealth that's been compounded over nearly a century. No. Millennia. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple centuries. That's a, that's a lot of compound interest. Mm-hmm. If you know about compound interest, you know what's up. But you know, they've, they've had this land and this wealth for a long, long time. Mm. That's the key. You don't just lose it. It's a hot take from Kieran. I know. Here's a hot tip for keeping money. Don't lose your money. I see when you got your money. Don't like (laughs) gee away in that. Or don't like piss off somebody. So the crown are like, actually, we're going to take your land and give it to somebody else. I feel that happens quite a lot. I wonder if anyone else has stumbled onto the fact that if you don't spend money, you have more money. Maybe. (laughs) You're going to be one of those gurus on TikTok that talks about finance. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Here's the secret, right? If you want more money, you just get yourself some more money. Yeah, just get some. And then once you've got it, then you lose it. It's all about the grind. But I'm not going to tell you what the grind actually means. It's just all about it. It's just all about the grind. Why are we talking about this? We have a two-parter episode. Why? F- focus, Ailey. Like, that's, that's plenty. <laughs> we can't be doing this. We are starting all the way back in the 1200s. Okay, okay. Uh, a fair way back again. That's yes. always what I expect with a castle. Well, yeah, because even if the current castle wasn't built that long ago, something has usually been on the site. Mm-hmm. Because a castle is usually built somewhere strategic. So people have always been there because it's always been strategic. Yep. So it does make sense. And 800 years ago was when the link between the land around Dunrobin, because this wasn't built yet, mm-hmm. and the Sutherland family began. Okay. But they weren't known as Sutherlands yet. Mm. They change their name over time. But this is when the link happens to begin with. Sounds good. I know that sounds strange because there's no castle and there's no Sutherlands. (laughs) But there will be. (laughs) It's all going to come together. I swear, this is where it happens. Yep. A man known as Hugh de Moravia. Huge de Moravia, yes. No. Hugh de Moravia. Okay, yeah. The de and then the name was quite popular then. Oh, yeah. It was like the Latin version, or it made it sound more French, which was desirable at the time. Mm. Um, He was Lord of Duffus. And in the 1200s, he received the lands that we now understand as Sutherland, which is an area of the Highlands. Just all of them? Yeah. He was given Sutherland. (laughs) That's where the name comes from. (laughs) Wow. And he was given these lands back in 1211. So we're right at the beginning of the 1200s. Okay. There are varying stories of where Hugh came from, but it seems like his grandfather was a Flemish settler who came to Scotland and started a new life here. Very cool. And did very well for himself. Very. Very. <laughs> where are Flemish people from, Kieran? Uh, Flemland. <laughs> <laughs> the Netherlands? Belgium. Belgium. This, this is why I checked. No idea at all. <laughs> Literally none. The name de Moravia is basically the like Latin version of the name Murray. Oh, okay. M O R A Y, mm-hmm. which is another area in Scotland. Did he have that as well? <laughs> it kind of it comes later. The family splits eventually. Oh, because you know multiple sons, so they're given different land. So mm-hmm. one branch is given Murray, and the other is given Sutherland. Mental. It's really weird talking about this as someone who lives in the Highland because in the highlands because it's such a huge area like there murray is a council area yeah the highlands is its own but it's a strange thought it's a very strange thought that somebody could, that somebody could just be given that yeah here you go here's your 21st birthday present except it was probably 12th birthday present because it's the year 1200 mm. Do they immediately go to war with each other once no, they get a bit each? No, eventually they don't get on very well because it's Naturally. the natural. Yeah, it's the natural progression of things that feuds are going to happen over mm-hmm. time. But it was Hugh's son who became the very first Earl of Sutherland mm. in twelve thirty five, because you can't just make yourself an Earl. The title has to be granted to you by the king. Got yeah, yep. So although Hugh had the land first. He wasn't an earl, his son was. Uh, well, that's, I hope he got to see that. I feel that would make him very happy. I I don't know. I'm not sure. All the dates are a little bit muddy at this time. Fair. 
But that's how long the title of Earl of Sutherland has been in use, and it's still active today. Damn, is it one family since then? Pretty much, less. yeah. Oh. Like, it's not a direct, like, father-to-child mm-hmm. line, but yeah, it's it's still the same family. Damn. Largely. When we get to the very end of episode... When we get to the very end of part two, there's a slight change to that. <gasps> Ooh, intrigue. <laughs> You'll have to come back for part two. Mm-hmm. Now, as well as being the Earl of Sutherland, William, who was Hugh's son, became the chief of Clan Sutherland. Oh, of course, there's still clans back yes, in 1200. the clan system is still in place. I... Yep, yep. I'm the clan system didn't break down until the 1700s. Yes. So he's the chief of Clan Sutherland. So this Pretty is a man cool. who has a lot of power. Yeah. As far back as the 1200s. Damn. Mr. Big Briefs over there. Absolutely. Now, he was in the favour of King Alexander II, who was the king at the time. He helped him out a lot with various things that he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Including going with the king when he marched into Caithness after some nasty business had occurred. Oh no. During this time, the 1200s, and we've talked a little bit about this before, at least parts of Caithness were under the rule of Norway. Okay. We talked about this in our Roslyn episode, I think, if you want to know more, because I'm not going to get too into this today. That rings a bell, yep. Um, But the Jarldom of Orkney was a Norwegian title. Mm. And... Parts of mainland Scotland in Caithness at one time were under Norwegian rule. So strange. Mm -hmm. So strange. So at this time, King Alexander didn't actually have authority in this part of Caithness when he was marching on it. Oh, isn't that weird? He can march on Caithness and technically be invading a different country. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, mainland Europe, that's far more common. Yeah, yeah. Now, the reason that he did this was because around 1222, the Bishop of Caithness was a man called Adam of Melrose, and he had a great deal of power, like all bishops did at this time. Mm-hmm. And Adam decided that he was going to increase the taxes for the people who were living around him in Caithness, which they absolutely did not like. Yep. yep. As you would expect. Classic rich person move. Yeah. And one of the items that was affected by these tax increases was butter. Oh. Um, he basically, he increased the taxes that farmers had to pay. It was either to make or sell butter. Mm. And the way they measured it was quite odd because before the change, there was a tax on the butter that you produce from every 20 cows and he increased it to every 10. Huh. That's strange. Yeah, it's an odd system. Hmm. But this meant that the farmers were going to make less money and they didn't like that. As they should. Int. The farmers were so upset that they actually went to the Jarl, who was a man called John Haraldson. I imagine it's Jan. Oh, yeah. Yep. They wanted him to do something about the bishop because they didn't think the taxes were fair. They thought that Bishop Adam was in the wrong. But the Jarl wasn't really that arsed. (laughs) To be honest, he didn't really care. And legend says that he told them, the devil take the bishop and his butter. You may roast him if you please. Uh oh, not this again. We've been here before. Not this again. <laughs> <laughs> in our Scottish Fairies mini series. Yes. We talked about this in the Red Caps episode. Mm-hmm. Someone in a position of power has been careless with their wording. Yep. And the angry mob has taken that to mean whatever they want it to mean. Mm. That's what happened here. And it's really gnarly. And thus gave birth to the phrase of buttering someone up. <laughs> And wish, then roasting them. Yeah, I, I wish it was that nice. <laughs> the farmers were so upset that they, because the Jarl didn't do anything, mm-hmm. they gathered outside Bishop Adam's home in a big angry mob. They killed the man who was sent out to calm them down. <laughs> he didn't do a very good job, did he? <laughs> no. <laughs> and even though at this sort of last moment, Adam tried to negotiate with them and fix the problems and say that he would change the taxes and everything... They burned him alive in his own home. Well, that's a bit much, isn't it? Burning down his home in the process. Well, if you're going to do something, do it right, you know? Yeah. Ooh. So King Alexander saw this happening as a chance to kind of extend his power and his influence in Caithness. Ah. Because he found out this had happened and he blamed the Jarl. 
Mm-hmm. So you did this. You caused this to happen. You stirred this. These were your words. You can't do that. You've led to the murder of a bishop. And King Alexander had the support of the Pope in this. And this is why William travelled to Caithness with the king. They were marching on it to restore order. Yep. And quell the rebellion from the Caithness farmers. That makes sense. So that's where all that <clears throat> that's where all that came from. Yeah. Tangent already, but I thought it was gnarly and gross and I want to talk about it. How could you not bring it up? Bring up your old butter bishop. He is a butter bishop, isn't he? Yeah. Now what's kind of bad in my opinion is um, I said just now that Alexander had the support of the Pope. Mm -hmm. The Pope was happy with what Alexander and his men had done. Even after learning that they had gone up to Caithness and they had basically hanged all of the farmers who were involved in the rebellion. They just got. Well, they just went and slaughtered the countless people, and the Pope was just like sweet. Well, he Good was job. because this was avenging the death and murder of a bishop. Ah, uh, so he commended them for it. Yeah. Oh, oh no. Mm-hmm. Which gave him more authority. Yep. Yep. I can see how that would happen. Ooh, not good though. Mm-mm. William also fought against the Vikings. Again, it's 1200. <laughs> this does make sense. Yep, he... Well, this is gonna, only going to get weirder for you, because he <laughs> fought against the Vikings at the Battle of Embo. <laughs> now, explain to the people why you're laughing. Because uh, Embo is a wee, like, seaside town. Definitely not somewhere you would expect to be fighting Vikings. No, it's famous, and the reason that I know it is because it has a caravan park and a beach. Yeah, I think of, like, ice cream and chippies. And grannies. And grannies. Maybe like a holiday with your granny yeah. in Embo. I did that. Did you? Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, this battle was in 1245, so it's after everything had happened in Caithness. Mm-hmm. And William managed to defeat the Viking invaders in this battle. Good job. But it was a bit dodgy. He had sent a man called Richard de Moravia. And from what I can see, Richard was William's cousin. Mm-hmm. Remember I said the family split? He sent Richard ahead of his own main army to hold the Vikings back until he could gather more men so that they could defeat them for good. Sounds good. Which is a tactic I've seen in different places. I don't know much about military tactics, but sounds fine. It's all they could do because they didn't have enough men and they didn't have enough time. Mm -hmm. So they needed someone to kind of hold them back until they could come with the main force. Mm -hmm. Dick can do it. Well, Dick didn't do it. Did Dick not do it? Dick died. Oh, no, no. He, he died before William could get there. Oh, he's no Dick Dastardly. No. Ooh. Dastardly things were done to Dick. Oh, Dick, you poor sod. <laughs> you poor Dick. <laughs> but during the battle, William apparently managed to defeat the leader of the Viking forces by killing him with a horse's leg. I caught a fish this big. Yeah, that's what it sounds like to me. I don't know if I believe that, but I thought you might enjoy it. It's a cool, cool story. But with a que- horse's leg. Well, question, mm. since we're here and it's gross. you got to bring it up. Which end did he kill him with? Is it the big, like, chunky end? Or is it the end with the hoof? Ooh, hmm. Yeah, I was thinking he picked up a somehow severed horse leg. And swung it like a club. Mm -hmm. Because you'd get, like, nailed by that. You would. And Um, it would really hurt. But see if you got him with the hoof. Mm. Stick him with the pointy end. Not even stick him. If you hit him with the hoof. (laughs) That's hard. Yeah, absolutely. If it has a horseshoe. Mm -hmm. It's metal. Mm -hmm. Mm. Or maybe he was on the horse and he just ran him over. Maybe. (laughs) Killed him with one leg. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You mean you trampled him? Yeah, but nobody's going to remember that. Hmm. Well, well, that's coming up a little later. later. <laughs> yeah, if you'd like to discuss it, or you would like to let us know your thoughts, please do. Or join us on Patreon, <laughs> where we're going to talk about horses' legs. <laughs> like normal people. Yeah, not for the vegetarians or vegans, I guess. Not for anyone. Yeah, not really for anyone. Now, this battle and this detail about Richard might seem minor, but... It caused a lot of problems for William down the road during his tenure as the Earl of Sutherland. Mm -hmm. Because the man who died in battle, Richard, he had a brother called Gilbert. Gilbert de Moravia. There's no funny nickname with that. (laughs) He had been made... 
He had been made the Bishop of Caithness after Adam of Melrose was burned to death. Okay. So he has this position of power. He's the new bishop. Mm -hmm. And his brother has just been sent to die by William de Moravia. Uh Uh-oh. So you can see there being issues. Troubles brewing. Mm Mm-hmm. After Adam's fiery death, Mm -hmm. it was decided that the new Bishop of Caithness probably shouldn't be based that far north anymore. Fair. Because it's not safe. (laughs) Mm. So the base for the bishop was moved to Dornach. Okay, yep, yep, yep. Which is a town that's not far from where Dunrobin Castle is now. Yes. So the Bishop of Caithness was moved onto William's land. Mm. But he's still the Bishop of Caithness, he's just not really in Caithness. Yes, for because, safety reasons. Yeah, it wasn't safe at that time. Because <laughs> mm-hmm, finding a fire-resistant bishop isn't very easy. No, but Gilbert actually kept a palace in Scrabster. He spent a lot of time up north. Hmm. He did it anyway, but the new base of the bishopric was in Dornoch. Again, palace in Scrabster doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> because Scrabster's just a pier in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine it's more than a pier. Yeah, but to me, I've only ever heard about the pier. True. Because of talking to fishermen. Hmm. It was because of Gilbert that Dornoch Cathedral was built. Oh, it's quite grand, I think, isn't yes, it? Yes, very grand, very beautiful, because this was now the base of the bishopric. So they built the cathedral. And this happened before the Battle of Embo, and William and Gilbert worked on the construction of the cathedral together. Well, that's nice. Fun project for and, them. And they weren't actually building it, but they were helping <laughs> each other order people around to have it built. <laughs> Not easy. But after the battle... A feud was started between the two. Mm. I'm assuming because Gilbert blamed William for his brother's death. Presumably. It makes sense. Yeah, because even if it was the right thing to do strategically, it would be too easy to go, you sent him to his death needlessly. Well, even if it was the strategic correct thing to do, you would still look at it and say, it's your fault. Yeah, absolutely. Because it was your call. You'd want to blame someone. Mm Mm-hmm. And this feud went on for so long that it didn't end up being resolved within their lifetimes. Gilbert actually died in the same year as his brother in 1245. Oh. They didn't make it up before then. Oh. Well, that's a shame. But William had Richard buried in Dorn Cathedral. Oh, well, that's nice. And you can still see the tomb. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Spooky. It's, like, it's difficult to explain. It's one of those coffins that's up out of the ground and it has the stone figure on the top Mm, mm -hmm. it's kind of crumbled now it's in pieces but you can still see it it's still there makes sense that's pretty good 900 years later 800 years later both gilbert and his predecessor adam of melrose are also buried in the cathedral gilbert is actually a saint oh he was the last scottish saint in the calendar of saints i believe Hmm. and there's a story that went around at the time that's lingered on about how he defeated a dragon oh yeah Mm -hmm. very cool because there's usually lots of stories like that about saints Mm -hmm. it's quite common so that's his one he defeated a dragon in sutherland well that's badass yeah (laughs) that's very badass maybe the dragon burnt his predecessor i mean does that make it better don't know (laughs) (laughs) William died in 1248, so just three years later. And following his death, his son, William, (laughs) became the second Earl of Sutherland. Mm. Now, there isn't much information about him. There's some documents that have survived that basically just show he was in this place on this date. And that's the only information they really have. Fair. Um, One of the documents shows the resolution of the feud between William and the church that had started with his father. Uh-huh. Uh, it was only resolved in his lifetime. And basically it meant William had to give some land to the church. I was about to say, was a great deal of money changed hands and then everybody was happy? A lot of land. And this land had Skibo Castle on it, which is another castle in the area. Uh, it's, that's basically the same, isn't it? But because he had to give something up, William was then given the land of someone else to make up for his loss. Ah, uh, yes, that's a thing that happens, isn't it? So, everybody's happy. Everybody's happy, probably. Not really. <laughs> uh, huh. It's not thieving, it was for the church. Yeah. Now, William was actually there when King Alexander III discussed the issue of his lack of an heir in uh, like Scottish Parliament. Airing his problems? 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was there at this parliament um, because Alexander's children had died. Okay. Leaving his young granddaughter, who was the maid of Norway, as his heir. Oh. And they were discussing how this was an issue because he didn't have anyone closer to pass it on to. Mm-hmm. And this problem was the precursor to the first war of Scottish independence. Oh, wow. When Alexander died. We have talked about it before. Oh, okay, yes. And William was also present in 1290 when a group of Scottish nobles travelled into England to King Edward to give permission for his son to marry Margaret, who was the maid of Norway. Mm. I can't remember which episode we talked about it in. It might be the Stone of Destiny. I don't remember. But she died before this marriage took place. She never landed in Scotland. Yep, I remember that. Very sad. Yes. But I'm not going to get too into that because we have a a certain project concerning the Wars of Independence in in the works. Maybe. (laughs) In the conflict that happened later, it seems that William didn't support the Scottish rebellion against the English king. Okay. Because... The, when Edward seized power, a lot of the Scottish nobles came together mm-hmm. to say they didn't like that. William didn't join them. In 1296, he pledged loyalty to Edward, oh. the English king. Now, a man called Robert Gordon, who was recording the Sutherland family history in the 1600s, okay. claimed that William fought with Robert the Bruce at the Battle of Bannockburn. Oh. But this does not appear to be true. Oh. Because, by all accounts, he was dead by then. Hmm. Because the battle happened in 1314 and uh, William died around 1308. So he couldn't have ridden into battle. Oh, well, that's a shame. Because if you can't trust your biographer, who can you trust? Well, we're going to talk about Robert Gordon more later. Okay. The reason you can't really trust a lot of what he wrote is because he's related to the family. Oh. Oh. He is one of the Sutherlands, so you can't... Well, you have to take everything he says with a pinch of salt. Mm, but he, he comes more into our story later. He would definitely be having them all slay dragons and yeah. fighting in all the major wars. There's a lot of that. It was actually his idea for this amazing thing that happened. <laughs> he did it single handedly mm-hmm. with a horse leg. <laughs> <laughs> so William dies, and his son, William, becomes the third Earl of Sutherland. Okay. But there's quite a lot of like William, Bill, Billy, Will, Willie. We could like we could mix it up throughout them. I mean, you could. It's going to confuse me. Yeah, I don't think it'll really help. <laughs> William the Third. Just want to say Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Stop talking about your Willie. Not mine. William the Third was very young at the time when his father died. He was too young to take charge. He couldn't run the Sutherland estate and name by himself. Now, if I know anything, there's a whole host of eager barons and such nearby, ready to jump in to selflessly help the young Earl. Well, luckily for William, the Earl of Ross was there to step in. Oh, there we go. (laughs) He wrote to King Edward II of England, highlighting the plight of young William and Mm. how he couldn't possibly rule and do it himself. So luckily the Earl of Ross was made his guardian. Well, thank God for that. (laughs) And, you know, since he was writing to the king anyway... (laughs) He updated Edward on the movements of Robert the Bruce and his army because mm. the Bruce was marching north. And the Earl of Ross basically said to the king, well, if I'm going to have any chance of keeping Robert and his forces at bay, I need the lands of Sutherland and I need the men to pledge fealty to me so that we're a united front. <laughs> That's uh, a bit scheming, but good work. Fair enough. <laughs> Isn't it just so lucky that he was there to do all of that? Well, that's really, because he's obviously going to give it back right after. And, and, you know, it doesn't serve him at all. No, there's no benefit for him. Hmm. Even with all of that sarcasm, basically (laughs) everything that the Earl of Ross said was bullshit, because he went on to make peace with Robert the Bruce and completely turned his back on King Edward. Oh, there you go. Even though Edward had given him what he wanted. Huh. (laughs) Don't know what the goal was there. I don't know, I think he's just picking the winning team. Well, yeah, actually, I said that, then immediately went, well, money and power was the goal there. Yeah. It always, always is. Self-preservation. Mm-hmm. Later, in 1320, William III, so he's he is the Earl of Sutherland, now he has his own title, mm-hmm. he's an adult. He signed the Declaration of Arbroath. 
as we have discussed before. The Declaration of Arbroath. Damn. Which was the document that was sent to the Pope to try and honour Scotland's independence. But I'm not getting too into this. <laughs> <laughs> William died around 1325. And he was still relatively young at this time. He died mm. young. He didn't have any children. So his brother became the fourth Earl of Sutherland. And he was called Kenneth. Not William. No, Kenneth. He wasn't just also William. No, they didn't name all their <laughs> children William. This is my son William. That's also William. Oh, hi, William. No, he's also, also <laughs> William. Now, I should say at this time, I'm referring to them a lot as Sutherlands, but they still have the surname de Moravia. Mm. So Kenneth's full title, for example, is Kenneth de Moravia, 4th Earl of Sutherland. Okay. Does that make sense? That does make sense. Quite a title. Yeah. His tenure was short-lived because he died five years later. Uh, well, see, the title didn't save him there, did it? <laughs> He died at the Battle of Halidon Hill, mm. and this was a battle against the English that the Scots lost, and this was during the Second War of Independence. Mm. Just lots of fighting. A lot of fighting. I feel we've come to the Second War of Independence quite fast after the first one. They weren't that far apart. Mm. Not really. I think it was 50 years. Damn. I can't remember exactly. I might have that completely wrong, but there wasn't that long between them. Mm-hmm. Now, Kenneth married a woman called Mary, who was the daughter of the Earl of Mar. So, another powerful noble, another more powerful family. I feel they've come up before, the Mars. Yes, they were down near the borders, Mm. I believe. They had a son called William, (laughs) who inherited the earldom after his father died in 1333. To another William. Another William, and 120 years have gone past. Mm -hmm. All Williams. Billy all the way down. Losing the William to live. Way. (laughs) Now, once again, we're looking at Robert Gordon's work when we're looking at William. And he paints him as an active participant in lots of battles against the English and fighting alongside the Scottish king. But there's a lot of debate as to whether or not this is actually true because a Mm. lot of the dates and the facts just don't match. It doesn't seem like he was this battle-hardened earl. Oh, no. But he was a favourite of the king. Well, that's something, I guess. That's true. But it just doesn't seem like he fought as much as Robert Mm -hmm. wants us to believe that he did. All I can think of is the part in Brave where there's the dads are introducing their sons for Meredith's hand. Meredith? Merida. Merida. And there's one guy, like, hyping up how brave and powerful his son is and this absolute wet blanket of a kid is there. (laughs) I imagine this is what Robert Gordon's doing to everybody. It seems like it, because it does happen several times Yeah, in his account of the family. Describing this single-handed battle. There's a kid there just, like, picking his nose, <laughs> reading his 12th century Beano. One of the reasons that it's fairly certain that William was a favourite of the king is that William married the king's sister. Oh, well, that's... Pretty good going. She was Margaret Bruce, mm. and she was Robert the Bruce's daughter. So Got that's you. where we are in history. Yes. So the Earls of Sutherland are very much in the big leagues now, mm. because they've married into the royal, royal family. Yeah. And now that he and the king are brothers-in-law, the king granted William lots more land and lots more power, because he was married to his sister. Yep, yep, that makes sense. Was he not quite young, or not necessarily? I'm just assuming that he's young and she's older in my head. Um, I suppose not necessarily. Not particularly. I don't have a lot of the birth dates. The yeah. death dates are recorded more than birth dates in these records. I think somehow I've got myself slightly confused amongst all these Williams. But I don't really matter. Apologies. Well, this William became the Earl in 1333. But that's not when he was born. Yes. If that helps. We'll go with that. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how else to clear it up. Well, we just we just got to go. I'll just make things up. It's fine. No. <laughs> just things you don't understand. I, I need to clear them up. Otherwise, other people won't know. Robert Gordon just makes stuff up. <laughs> He's a professional. <laughs> now, I should say that this is just the start in our story of men marrying women. Mm-hmm. And then none of the information about the woman is recorded in any way. Yeah. 
that checks out, doesn't it? So the only information that I can really get about these women a lot of the time is who their fathers are mm. and who their husbands are and who their sons are. Boring. Because even their daughters are just names and sometimes mm. they're not even named. And it's really aggravating. That is really aggravating. Even though she was the sister of the king, mm -hmm. I don't have a lot about her. We need a series on badass. Badass. We need a series on badass Scottish women. Yes, I think so. It's just, it's really aggravating because mm -hmm. they just don't matter. Yeah. So the gift of all these, all this land and all this power to the Earl of Sutherland basically made him like a king in the north. Mm. Which caused a lot of issues because other nobles and other powerful figures in the Highlands didn't like this imbalance of power mm. because they viewed him at least as their equal to the power that they had because they also had land. They had men fighting for them. So they didn't like that he was starting to exercise this authority over them that he didn't have. Just lording it up. Oh, well, yeah. And we'll come back to this in a minute because this caused some major issues. Margaret Bruce... William's wife, mm -hmm. died sometime before 1346. And it seems that she might have died in 1344, giving birth to their one and only son. Mm -hmm. Which is very sad. Mm -hmm. But we know it was before 46, because William remarried. Okay. A woman called Joanna Menteith. But I'm, I'm not sure exactly when she died. William was taken prisoner in 1346. Mm. At the Battle of Neville's Cross, which was also against the English. Like every other one so far. They're just so easy to battle, you know? <laughs> and it was after this, in 1351, that King David II of Scotland, so William's brother-in-law, mm -hmm. was actually held captive by the English for ransom. Oh, shit. And William was part of the group that travelled with David back into Scotland. Oh. But William's son, John of Sutherland was kept hostage in England in exchange for the king. Oh. To ensure that he came back. Oh. So that's the king's nephew. Yes. Damn. That is... You're obviously thought quite highly of if your son is worth that much. You are, yeah, but imagine how difficult that would be. Yeah. Yeah. But this was common. This happened a lot with kings, especially Scottish kings. Mm -hmm. They were held in England and... Just got captured a lot. <laughs> yeah, and either people would be held until a ransom was paid or a king would get some time away to, I don't know, take care of things, but hostages would be kept in his place. That's so strange. So one of these was William's son. And John was important not just because he was King David's nephew. Mm -hmm. He was King David's heir. Ah. Because David didn't have any children. Oh, shit. So William's son was the heir to the Scottish throne. Fuck. That's how powerful they had become. Double fuck. Right? Yeah. This is why you have to go into so much, because this is how much influence they had. Yeah, so sort of the Sutherlands become king? Well, let me tell you. Or does he get down? The, the king and have himself a son? He can <laughs> That was a really weird way of explaining that. <laughs> well, over several years, William's son was held in England. And I think in 1357, the Earl himself was held, along with his son, down near London, so that David could return to Scotland. It's so weird that, oh, well, you, you have, you're still king, so you still have a level of respect, which is fine. But there's, well, we've captured you, but you have stuff to do, so you can go home. It's a really mad system. But you have to come back. So he comes back, does his kingly organisation, whatever that is. So, oh, sorry, actually you have to go go back to being caught. I'm captured right now, so I'm going to have to duck back to London. I guess it's just a way of exercising control and authority. Yeah. That like you have to answer to me, you have to answer to my whim, and you have to come to my request. Mm -hmm. In 1358, William was granted Uckert Castle. Oh. And the land around it by King David. Very nice. Uh, so things seem well between them, even mm -hmm. with all of this hostage taking. But William's son John died in 1361, when he was only 17. Oh, that's a shame. And he was the heir. Yes. Oh. But would you believe it? He died in London 
of the plague. Oh no! <laughs> the actual plague. The actual plague. Oh no! Mm-hmm. I thought the plague was like seventeen, sixteen hundred. I mean, there's different rounds of the plague. That's true. Eh? That could have been a plague. Eww. But that's how close the Sutherlands came to being kings oh. and queens of Scotland. That is like Game of Thrones level mm-hmm. of close. Justin, no more. Because another one of David's nephews, Robert II, was made king when David died. Because he mm. never had children. Yep. Mental. Mm-hmm. Oh, I wonder if he was doubly disappointed, uh, William, whose son died, that he's lost his son, obviously heartbreaking, but that his family line won't be royalty. I wonder if that was like, equally as crushing as losing his son because i have to assume these things are important oh well it, it's everything yeah even if it's not to you like that your family will have that after you're gone like i assume that so to so to have lost that must have been crushing mm-hmm. and you have you have no way of like getting that back because no. like margaret had died they can't have more children that's it. What are you going to do? Now, remember I told you that a lot of people weren't happy that William had so much power. Yes. As Earl of Sutherland. One of the people who was the most upset was a man who was effectively his neighbour. <laughs> uh, a man called I. Mackay of Strathnaver. And that's I. Mackay spelled I-Y-E. <laughs> Mackay. <laughs> I will not be taking criticism for my pronunciation at this time. <laughs> That's the most Scottish and fabulous name I've ever heard. Hi, mm-hmm. <laughs> hi. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that he was the chief of Clan Mackay. So another powerful person. Mm. But they were feuding. I didn't like that William had this authority and had so much more power than he did. I've done it already. Like, why didn't you like oh, it? Sorry. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call him Mackay. That will make it easier. So what was wrong with it? Why didn't you like it? Oh, I see. I see why I did there. <laughs> In Mackay's view, they both own land. Mm-hmm. They both had power. William had no authority over him. And Mackay got so upset about this that he went to the king to argue his case that William was overstepping. He had no place telling him what to do or trying to get things from him. Mm-hmm. And it was all happening around 1370. This is 10 years or so after... John had died. Now, William and Mackay were arranged to have a meeting in Dingwall in 1370 to try and resolve things between them because it was escalating. The king was having to be involved. Mm -hmm. It's getting nasty. They need to nip this in the bud. And at the time, with the proceedings that Mackay had brought forward, it was looking like he was going to win. He was going to have his requests met. The king was going to agree with him. And be like... Toe the line, William. Yeah, that he was going to lose some influence and some power mm-hmm. here to try and bring balance back to the area. Balance back to the force. Yeah. At this meeting, William's brother, Nicholas, killed Mackay and his eldest son. Well, that's a bit extreme. Just killed them at the meeting. Fuck. Was the king just like, fair enough, problem settled? Well... Nothing really happened. Even though Nicholas had killed the chief of a clan and his heir. Yep. And I think part of this is that William died a year after. Oh. I don't really know what happened to Nicholas, but William died. And the rumour was that he was murdered in revenge, since it happened so close together. I mean, that's fair to assume, I think. Damn. Damn. Don't try and solve your problems verbally. Just murder people who disagree with you. That's Uh, wild. That is wild. Just killed them. Just fucking killed him. Done. No one to argue with now. Well, there was no way they could cover it up because the Mackays were on the cusp of getting their Mm -hmm. requests met and then they die. Um, uh, Him and his son, they both choked on a piece of ham. It's suspicious. It's quite suspicious. I'm heckin' suspicious. Mm -hmm. William is dead. It's 1371. And his son, Robert, became the sixth Earl. 
uh, his mother was Joanna, who was mm-hmm. William's second wife. So not Margaret Bruce. Got you. Now, he's the first of all of them to drop the surname de Moravia. Oh. In favour of Sutherland. So now he's known as Robert Sutherland, 6th Earl of Sutherland. Gotcha. He just changes the name. Oh, fair play. Mm -hmm. It seems like quite often this was done so that the Earl could be acknowledged as the clan chief of Clan Sutherland. Oh, okay. It's quite particular about the the surname you have. Mm. That's still a thing. So it seems like that would be the reason for doing that. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, and who's king? Sorry. And at the moment, King Robert II is king. And after King David. Yes. And that was a different nephew of King yeah. David. Yeah. I know it's confusing. I'm trying not to linger on it too much. It's all right. I'm just getting all right in my brain. Yeah. But to a point, we just got to breeze through, don't we? Kind of, yeah. You just let the history wash over you. A nice warm bath of history. Yeah. Snuggle up. In the bath? Can you snuggle up in a bath? I can't. I'm too short. <laughs> I'll drown. <laughs> if I curl my legs up, I'll just sink. <laughs> now, Robert was one of the nobles present in Inverness in 1389 when a religious order was given. Mm-hmm. And this was given to a man called Alexander Stuart, who was the Earl of Buchan. Okay. Now, this religious order was ordering him to return to his wife after spending years and years cavorting with his mistress. The church knew about it. He'd had a large family with his mistress and had completely abandoned his wife. Can't be doing that. While continuing to take advantage of all of the influence and land that she had brought to the marriage. Definitely can't be doing that. Nasty piece of work. Yes. Nasty piece of work. Shitbag. Robert was there when this was issued. Robert Sutherland. Yes. Yes. But Robert married one of Alexander Stewart's daughters. Oh. So he saw that and wanted a bit of that influence and power for himself. <laughs> what a bastard. What are we going to do about it? Quick, go and like cozy up to her over there. Yeah, pretty much. He <laughs> married Margaret Stewart. Hmm. They're all just bastards, aren't they? Kind of, yeah. All of them. Yeah. Like, it's always super interesting going through these like family histories, but you're always just like, oh. <laughs> yeah. I don't think anyone has ever gotten this much money and been a nice person. No. Or at least been a nice person the whole time. Mm -hmm. Now, fun fact, Robert and Margaret had several children, but one of the daughters that they had together Mm -hmm. married William Calder. Ooh. The Thane of Calder. Very cool. Who we talked about in our Cotter Castle episode. Yeah. All comes around. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's so much of that this episode. I'm going to blow your mind. (laughs) It was in 1401 that a fort, that a fort was mentioned for the first time on the site that the current Dunrobin Castle is built on. I forgot that's why we were here. (laughs) Sorry. Genuinely forgot that's what we were gearing up (laughs) to. It hadn't been built yet. Yeah, I was like, ooh, a fort. Like, what's a fort of? Oh, yes. (laughs) The title of the episode. (laughs) That's why we needed two parts. <laughs> <laughs> and the building of this fort was down to Robert. He's the one who had it built mm. on the site. He had been left like quite specific lands by his father and it had been passed down that he should get the mill at Dunrobin. So that's mm. what was there before. So it seems like a good spot to have the hub of the estate. So that seems why the site was chosen. And there are stories that suggest that Dunrobin is named after Robert. Mm. Dunrobin. Robert. Okay, okay. But the early castle was much simpler than what's there now. It was basically a big square and it was more of a keep Mm. than a palace. Makes sense. Do you think he signed it? Done by Robert. That'd be really funny. (laughs) If we ever lay any concrete, you should write done by Kieran. Yeah. (laughs) This will be Dunkier Castle. Almost sounds right. Mm. Weirdly. Now, I think some of this early castle from the 1400s still exists. There's parts of it that make up the current structure. But what we see is very different to what was there then. Yes. Obviously. Now, it's somewhere between 1427 and 1433... The feud between the Sutherlands and the Mackays, who we were talking about, yep, 
bubbled over. They're still feuding. They are. And this is where it kind of hit the boiling point. I think they carried on feuding after this, but this is a particularly like painful point. Yep, that makes sense. The chief of Clan Mackay at this time was called Angus Dew. And by 1427, he was an old man. He was elderly. And his eldest son was actually being held on base rock. Oh. Which we were just talking about. Yeah. He was a prisoner of King James I, <laughs> who was now king. So he wasn't really able to help his father in his role as chief. He couldn't support him because he was in prison. Mm-hmm. I won't get into it, but Angus Dew and the Mackays had invaded Caithness and attacked Clan Gunn. And the king got very angry about this. He appeared in Inverness, so Angus Dew had to submit to the king. Mm. And he had to hand over his eldest son. Oh, yeah. Who was put in prison. Yep. It was a whole thing. A whole, a whole thing. Do you think he was all like, do as I Angus say, not as I Angus do? Do you know, I'm going to, we are going to go see my dad on Sunday, who's called Angus. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get him to start saying that. (laughs) If he doesn't, I'm going to get it on a t-shirt and yep. I'm going to make him wear it. He has say, to Dad, wear it. I'll cry if you don't wear the shirt. I will disown you as my father. I'm going to do it. I think we should do that. I'm going to do it. That should definitely happen. Dad, if you don't want me to do it, tell me now. Oh, too late. I see you didn't mess with me, so. <laughs> that was your chance. So, old Angus do. Mm-hmm. His cousins were now causing him some trouble. Mm. So it's a real issue now that his eldest son isn't there to help him. Because he's he's old and he, he can't face this kind of conflict. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have it in him. He had a cousin called Thomas. And Thomas had fucked up, basically. He'd killed the Laird of Freswick mm. along with a bunch of his men. And I won't get into the details why, but he killed him, he killed his men, and he killed them inside a church. Oh no. Near Tain. That is dumb fucking up. And then he burnt the church down. Oh my god. <laughs> so there's fuck ups and then there's Thomas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not, a good, not a good guy. No. Not a good guy. But there are a few good guys in this story. Well, that's true. Spoiler. He's, he's in good company, isn't he? King James was furious at what Thomas Mackay had done. Fair. Killing the laird and then the way in which it was done. He was furious. So he basically put out a bounty for Thomas. Nice. He said that he would give Thomas's lands and fortune to whoever captured or killed him. Mm. So dead or alive. Yep. And unsurprisingly, with terms like this, Thomas was soon captured. That does check out. Yep. But he was captured by his own brothers. Oh. Who want that bounty? Yeah. Wow, you've really fucked up if your own brothers are going to turn you in for money. Yeah. Very cold. Yep. Very cold. Oh no. His brothers, Neil and Morgan, and I've shortened their names because they have middle names and things as well, but we're calling them Neil and Morgan, Mm -hmm. had helped men from Clan Sutherland capture their brother. And Sutherland are their ancient enemies. Yep. They've teamed up with them to capture their own brother. Mm. Well, that's going to get them all turned on, presumably. Going to get them all turned on? (laughs) <laughs> what are you saying uh, that's going to cause the clan to turn on them presumably well, that's not what you said what are you thinking about <laughs> burning down ter- churches got you feeling some kind of way you feel quite hot when you're there <laughs> yeah it's a very sticky situation mm-hmm. it's not good they haven't acted in good faith in any way. Mm-hmm. And their capture of their brother led to his execution in Inverness. So they literally led him to his death. Yep. For his land and his money. Oh. And had helped their clan's enemies do it, basically. That's not going to go down well. No, it caused a big rift across the clan. I was about to say, that's just now going to cause feuding, feuds within feuds. Yeah, well, because some people supported the brothers. They thought they had done the right thing by handing Thomas over because mm. they didn't agree with what he had done. Yeah, just a straight up, to be fair, kind of deserved it, Well, because remember, <laughs> he did a horrible thing. I'm mm-hmm. not saying he deserved to die, but he had done a horrible thing. So some people felt that because of this and the fact that the order came from the king, they if they... 
had gone against that, then they're mm-hmm. going against the king. They thought it was the right thing to do. But others felt that this was a real betrayal of their clan and their family. Because not only had they turned on their own just for money, mm-hmm. they'd done it with the help of the Sutherlands. Yeah, that's... Which made it even worse. If you're not going to like it, you're going to seriously hate it. Yeah, for some people, this was absolutely unforgivable, mm-hmm. what they had done. But the Sutherlands didn't see it this way. They saw the benefits of having a relationship with these Mackay men. Yep. Robert and one of his most esteemed men, Angus Murray, actually gave them their daughters to marry as a reward for what they had done. Oh. Because they're property and it doesn't matter. Yeah, because you just, that's just a good reward. That's what yeah. they're there for. Nice treat. Ugh. It's well, so stupid. It's my nose wrinkled for the rest of the it's episode. It's so stupid. Ew. Now, to me, what happened next kind of seems like action of opportunity. Okay. Because I think Sutherland and Murray saw that the Mackays were weakened mm-hmm. by this division and they jumped on it. Did they just flatten them and then take all all the Mackay lands? Well, after greatly rewarding Neil and Morgan mm-hmm. for what they had done, Robert ordered his fighting men from Clan Sutherland to follow Neil and Morgan, take orders from them, in order to take all of Angus Mackay's land. Yeah. Sneaky. Because now they have Mackay men who can basically claim, like, no, we are in charge. Yep. Sutherland couldn't do it. No. But the Mackays can do it. The Mackays can do it. He's tricksy. You see, it's opportunistic. Yep. He's seizing it. Now, Kieran. Yes. Speaking to you specifically. Yes. Hello. I'm awake. What do you think? Any guesses as to what happened next? Hmm. I think uh, basically like total domination. Okay. The Mackay brothers managed to take all the power, became the leaders and the clan chiefs and swore fealty to Mr. Sutherland. That's what I think. It's a good guess. Mm -hmm. That is a calculated guess. Mm -hmm. It wasn't quite so cut and dry. Hmm. Remember, Angus Mackay's eldest son, his heir, is imprisoned down in Base Rock. Yes. Yes. Yep. He can't do anything to help his elderly father, so it seems like they're in a bad spot. Nope, he's just out there counting seagulls. Yeah. Luckily, Angus had another son. Uh Uh-oh. Plot twist. John Mackay. Ooh. And he kind of enters our story, like possibly as its hero, but there's not really any heroes. Mm. John knew that his father needed help. He couldn't do this on his own. And he seems to have been incredibly loyal to his father. He was quite devoted to him. He told Angus not to give the Sutherlands an inch. They had said, like, basically, hand over your lands. Mm-hmm. And John told him no, not to give in. Because John told his father that he would defend their land or he would die trying. Fair play. He wasn't going down without a fight. Bold. But it's all subjective. Remember, the Mackays had attacked Caithness not long ago. So they're the bad guys in that story. Oh, yes. So it's all subjective. You have to be careful. Well, it just depends who you're rooting for, really, doesn't it? It's why the clan system led to so much fighting. Every clan was fighting with every other clan. It's how it worked. Yeah. It just depends whose perspective you want to take. Yeah. All this feuding finally came to a head after the Mackays refused to give up their land Mm -hmm. to the Sutherlands. On a hill called Carnfada, not far from Tung, the village, the Battle of Drumnaku was fought. Mm. It's either Drumnaku or Drumnakaub. Don't know. It's just how it's spelt. Give me marks out of ten for my pronunciation. Two. I mean, savaged this episode. Twelve. Like Miss, mental age or Miss Opportunity? She was at seventeen. Well, that, yeah, that is the thing. That's the, oh. Please continue. Uh. This battle, whatever it was called, was incredibly bloody. Mm. Just vicious. Each side came to the battlefield at Carnfada with around twelve hundred men. So significant. Mm-hmm. After the battle, or actually, do you want to tell me how many men total survived the battle? Oh, each side had twelve hundred. So you're looking at 
two, two and a half thousand men almost. Um, mm, How many survived? 500. 500? Yes. About nine men survived? <laughs> nine men survived? Or 11. It varies. Uh, uh, oh, oh my days. Yep. That's, I mean, oh. How can you still be fighting when there's like 50 of you left on either side? Assuming it happened evenly, which it must have to have gotten down to that small a number. Surrounded by 20, 2,400 dead bodies. Yep. But you're like, well, the battle's not over yet. We've got to keep giving it to them. That's how fiercely they were fighting. Yeah. And that, they wouldn't let it go. That is fucked up. And they didn't run. They they fought. They fought. And George, fought. George Buchanan, a historian from the 1500s, mm-hmm. so almost contemporary, but not quite. He wrote, they immediately, er- they immediately turned their rage upon each other. Having gathered together almost an equal number... For each supported about 1,200 ruffians by public rapine. They engaged with such fury that scarcely a messenger was left to carry the tidings of their mutual destruction. Mutual destruction. Some say 11 and others 9 were all that remained. It is certain, however, that the king, who was much incensed against both parties, could hardly find any to punish. Jeez, oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's just sort of taking care of itself. Well, they're all dead. Yeah. I look, I kind of like the way that he's phrased that when he's talking about mutual destruction. Yes, very and much so. They turned their rage upon each other. Because mm-hmm. that's what it seems like. It seems yeah. just fury incarnate. Well, only fury and hatred could make you fight like that. Mm-hmm. To the last man, mm-hmm. near enough. So with so much bloodshed and death, it seems silly to ask... But who do you think won the battle? Oh, um, the Sutherlands. No. Oh, shit. (laughs) It was very close and it was a very slim victory, if a victory at all. I mean, it must have been five to four at that point. Well, (laughs) the Mackays won the day, but mainly because out of all the leaders of their forces, John Mackay was the only one left alive. Jesus. Although he was down an arm. (laughs) <laughs> so living <laughs> not all of his limbs sans one arm yes oh well that's not very good no Neil and Morgan Mackay were both dead yeah which some felt were just desserts for them yes Angus Murray the father-in-law to one of them had also died mm-hmm. he had led the Murrays who supported the Sutherland side into battle yes but he was killed in the battle mm-hmm. Angus Dew was also dead but arguably this was more heartbreaking. He had survived the battle until the end. And that even after leading his men into battle with his son mm-hmm. as an old man. But when the battle was over, Angus was checking the field for the bodies of his cousins, mm. Neil and Morgan. And what nobody realised was one of the surviving Sutherlands was hiding in some of the growth. And he shot Angus Dew with an arrow. Oh. After the battle was over, as he was searching for his family. Ooh, that's nasty. How sneaky is that? Yeah. There's no honour in that. No. Not that there's honour anyway, but there's no. particularly no honour in that. Yeah, that's somehow worse. Because mm-hmm. it's, not, it's not out in the open. Yeah. It's not a fair fight. I thought about it while he was searching for his family. Yeah. That's not good. mm Mm. Now, there's differing reports about what happened next because some accounts say that John Mackay had to flee to the Isles mm. where he had family because Robert, the Earl of Sutherland, was so angry at how the battle had gone that he wanted to hunt John down Fair. and have him killed. These same accounts suggest that John managed to sneak home for Christmas, oh. which is kind of nice. Oh, well, yeah, that'd be nice, I guess. But other counts disagree with this idea completely because they say it would be ridiculous for John to flee because he had just won the battle. So why would he flee? And also a good point. Yeah. Also a good point. There's there's differing ideas. Yeah. But I guess even if like he won the battle, but he has no men left 
to defend himself with in case anyone else comes a knocking. So it's not to me. It's not totally ridiculous that he might no, have fled. No, it's not. It was Robert Gordon who said he fled. Mm. So again, don't know. Maybe, maybe. Regardless of what happened, King James the First died, and John's older brother Neil was released from Base Rock in oh, fourteen thirty-seven, yes. and he returned home to lead the clan because he was the eldest son. That makes sense. Yeah. And then Robert, the sixth Earl, died in 1444. Can you imagine hearing about that battle from the rock? Hearing about the death of your father, yeah. knowing you couldn't do anything? Heartbreaking. Awful. Especially knowing that your father like missed you, like he mm-hmm. needed your help, and your younger brother had to pick up the slack. Yeah, it's not going to feel good. No, no. Robert had many children during his lifetime, but his eldest son, John, inherited the earldom, as you would expect. Yep. Uh, John was another Sutherland who was held in exchange for a king's ransom. Oh, really? Yep. He was held at Pontefract Castle in exchange for King James I while he was still living. Damn. Why do these kings keep getting captured? It seems to be a lot of Scottish kings. It it, it just keeps happening. They keep going to battle and then... Because remember, we talked about King James I being held in England. We did, yeah, because he was held there for... Quite a long time. Yes, and yeah. then released back into Scotland, basically as an English king. Yep. Hmm. Now, during his time as Earl of Sutherland, John fought off an attack by the Earl of Ross. When we talked about the Earl of Ross some time ago, at the Battle of Skibo, and then later at the Battle of Strathfleet. Mm-hmm. Although I should say that he didn't do any of this himself. He got <laughs> lots of his powerful men to do it for him. Yeah. Including so- his younger brother. Hmm. Imagine sending off your younger brother to fight for you because you're too precious. <laughs> Don't like that. Don't like that. I can't imagine forcing them to do something that you just wouldn't do. Yeah. But you're probably not forcing them. They're I probably guess. happy to do it. Like his younger brother, he's probably dying to do it. He'd probably be more upset if he wasn't allowed to. It just doesn't sit right with me. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It doesn't sit right with me at all. John married a woman called Margaret, another Margaret, Mm -hmm. and they had several children. There's lots of big families, but unfortunately their eldest son died before John did in 1416. Oh, I was going to say, there's lots of big families, but there only seems to be like four names. Yeah, (laughs) that continues. Mary, Margaret, William and John, and they're just cycling through them. (laughs) This all meant that John's second son, John... (laughs) Took over Dunrobin Castle. He Mm -hmm. became the eighth Earl. Very good. Now, John really did not seem like a nice person, even by the standards of like wealthy people. Mm. He was particularly nasty. He abducted the children of one of his rivals and was forced to return them by law. Well, that's creepy and And awful, isn't it? The courts had to intervene and they told him that he had done the wrong thing by taking these children yeah and he was forced to give them back oh no that's not good Mm -mm. he was also charged with unkindness to his mother he treated her particularly badly bastard he had her home in helmsdale pulled down what what an arsehole yeah there's always one isn't there Mm -hmm. there's always one who's just a right tosser there's several oh no (laughs) But like that's nasty. That is nasty. There were rumours that he forced her to get remarried. Because remember, his, his father had died. Mm-hmm. But there doesn't seem to be proof for that. So I think that's just rumour and mm. story. Because he was actually a nasty person. Yeah, it seems more likely. Over the course of his life, he was caught up in a huge number of legal battles. Mm. Which are confusing, I can't explain them. But lots of disputes over land that he was embroiled in. Lots of disputes. And I wish I had more information on this, but there, there's very little available. But historical records suggest that he ordered the murder of two of his nephews. What? Because they pissed him off. Oh, come on now. I, I, not even exaggeration. Yeah. That seems to have been the reason. There was something about their conduct I read that he didn't like. Oh, they so he s- ordered their murder. They slighted him. Mm-hmm. It seems that their dad was John's brother, Mm -hmm. but I think their dad was illegitimate. 
Oh, I see. So I don't know if that fed into anything. That seems to be the case. Mm-hmm. One, of the, one of the boys was killed in Dunrobin. Oh, and he successfully had them yes, killed as well. in the castle. Oh. And his brother managed to escape for a little while, but John's men caught up to him before long and killed him. Oh. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, his own nephews. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure it was his youngest brother. Grim. Sick. Sick in the head. So all of this compounded makes for quite an unstable person. Yes. You agree? I think it's safe to say he's an arsehole. Well, people back then thought this too. Oh. Something called a breve of idiocy <laughs> was issued by King James IV mm. in 1494. So we're getting towards 1500s now. I had to look this up, but it's basically what it sounds like. This petition suggests that someone isn't fit to manage their estates or conduct their affairs Mm -hmm. due to mental weakness, which it was suggested that John had. I mean... seen less as just cruel and more as mentally unwell. Yeah. Seems so. If you're killing your own nephews, I would have to agree. Yeah. Something's not right there. No one can hear that and be like, fair enough. Yeah. No no one's saying anyway. No. So a court was held in Inverness, basically to decide whether or not John, the 8th Earl of Sutherland, I remember this is a position of huge power and influence, Mm -hmm. he's being brought to court to see if he's fit to take charge and have the title and the responsibilities that come with it. Presumably he's not. Yeah, so what do you think? I'm going to say, well, I want to say that he's clearly not fit. But that generally doesn't really factor in. So they're probably going to be like, fair enough. They must have slighted him. His nephews obviously deserved it or something. But I hope that he gets his power stripped from him, given to his son, maybe. Well, he was deemed unfit. Good. The court decided that he couldn't manage his own affairs. So someone had to step in. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't stripped of being the Earl, but he wasn't in charge He was placed under the care of a tutor who helped him and supported the running of the estate. So he's still kind of the figurehead. He's still living in Dunrobin, but he doesn't really have the power and he's not running things anymore. Mm. And he has someone there who's helping to make his decisions. So I feel that's someone who can act as the barrier to be like, no, we're not going to do that. Yeah, like a minor. We're not going to kill more children. Yep. I can't, I can't see anyone taking well to that. I'm being like, sweet, that's the way it is now. I guess it depends how much you're aware of, though. Yeah, I suppose it depends what. Depends on the nature of the thing. Mm-hmm. It's not clear what he suffered no. from. Um, he married at some point, but the records of his marriage are really vague and incomplete. Mm. It's difficult to tell who he was actually married to and how many times, which is unusual because yeah. he was the Earl of Sutherland. Strange. Some records refer to his wife as a woman called Fingal or Catherine Fraser. But others suggest that he married a daughter of the Earl of Ross. Oh, okay. It's it's not plain. Mm-hmm. In 1499, documents refer to John divorcing his wife Fingal. So that's the basis I'm going on. That yep. For there to be a divorce, there must have been a marriage. One has to be, one can't be without the other. Mm-hmm. And there are records that show that Rents and dues and things from the estate were being paid to Fingal. She was gathering them. So she was helping run the estate. Yeah, well, somebody had to. So. Yeah. <laughs> John and his wife, question mark, had four children together. Okay. A son, then a daughter, and then two sons. Although their youngest son died very young mm-hmm. and may have been illegitimate. Mm-hmm. Again, because there's so much we don't know. And the assumption is that John died in 1508. But once again, the records are less than stellar because while lots of other documents have survived, even longer than 1508, the documents for something as important as the death of an earl, which dictates the succession, are lost. Do you think they were lost? I Yeah, I, th- I think they're trying to scrub him out. Yeah, trying to just muddy mm-hmm. his image. Make sure he's just kind of forgotten about it. don't talk about him. No, gonna I, do that. I think that's exactly what it was, because the death of an earl is an important thing. Mm-hmm. 
because it dictates who the title goes to. And if all the records are still available. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we know a lot more about some of the earls before him than him himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think somebody, somebody along the lines tried to sweep him under the rug. I think so. I think it's been accidentally dropped mm-hmm. and then not picked up and possibly burned. Yep. So John's eldest son, John, <laughs> was made the ninth Earl of Sutherland. Are you following me? I'm following you. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, it seems whatever John Sr. had, John Jr. had too, because he had oh. similar mental issues to his dad. That's a shame. It's referred to everywhere as mental weakness, which Mm. isn't the term we'd use today. And it's difficult to know exactly what that means because they didn't understand it. Impossible to know, isn't it? Um, But neither of them were fit to manage the estate. Mm -hmm. They both had problems that were severe enough that it hindered their ability to do that. So what to do? What to do? This new John didn't have any children that the title could be passed down to. Yep. So who was going to run the Sutherland estate? Who's going to run the Sutherland estate? Could it be his younger sister? Surely not. Surely not. That would be exciting. Where John was deemed inept, his younger sister Elizabeth was seen as perfect for the role of managing the estate. She was quick. She was smart, she was confident, she was everything that they needed. Mm -hmm. And although John had been the Earl since 1508, he hadn't really been in control for any of the time he'd had the title. I actually read that he didn't fully take charge until 1512 because he didn't or couldn't take the like pledges of loyalty to the king that are required to become the Earl. Interesting. That that just didn't happen until then. Yeah. I wonder if he didn't have the mental capability to like remember it and well, say that, it. Or... The, the way that he got power in 1512 gives me a reason why he didn't take it until then, okay, okay. which I will explain. Mm-hmm. For some of his rule, the crown had actually taken over running the earldom. Oh, yeah. And at some point, the Bishop of Caithness actually gathered the rents instead of John. So a lot of people were helping to manage this very large estate. Yes. But for another large portion of his time in the boss's chair, his sister Elizabeth had been running the show. Mm. She had been managing everything, along with her husband, who is a man called Adam Gordon. Ah, um, oh, a, a Gordon? Yes. Such as a Robert Gordon? Interesting. Yes. Interesting. <laughs> They'd gotten married in 1500, and Adam Gordon was very powerful in his own right. Oh, that's good. His father was the Earl of Huntley Mm. and chief of Clan Gordon. Very cool. So they lived like out towards Leith Hall, Mm -hmm. that direction. And on top of that, Adam's mum was the youngest daughter of King James I. Oh. So his grandfather was literally the King of Scotland. Well, that's a good qualification, isn't it? Lots of money there. Mm Mm-hmm. When John officially took on the earldom in 1512. Yes. Elizabeth and Adam were finally able to push forward to get a brief of idiocy for Earl John, just like it happened to his father. Ah. So I think they allowed him to go through the process to become Earl officially, Mm -hmm. because that's the only way they can prove that he's incapable of doing it. Yes. Because you can't prove he can't do it if he's never done it. Yep, yep, that's... In its own weird way, that is fair enough. Right, he has to become the Earl... So that you can say, he's unfit to be Earl. Mm -hmm. You have to let him fail before you can prove that he's failed. Yes. You've got to let him commit the crime so he can do the time. Yeah. And it seems strange, but yes. Mm -hmm. This brief of idiocy, the petition was accepted and the brief was issued by King James V. Mm -hmm. And a court was held in Perth to assess John in 1514. And they did it in Perth so that the people who were on the court and in the jury weren't influenced by the local area yep. that this was affecting. John was deemed, quote, not a complete idiot, though he was probably of weak intelligence. <laughs> Unquote. Charming. Is it? I kind of want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> not a complete idiot, but probably of weak intelligence. <laughs> Well, my wife says to me when she's flirting with me. 
Now, it sounds like very cruel language, but they were using the term idiot differently to the way we would now. Yeah, it's almost a medical definition yeah. rather than an insult. Yeah, they don't... It is cruel language. Yes. But it's not the meaning that they attach to the word, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. One of the markers of his intelligence, and one of the reasons that he wasn't deemed like completely irretrievable, was that he understood the process of the court and what was happening to him. Oh, okay. Yeah. He understood the nature of proceedings. Mm -hmm. So he has some level of intelligence because he understands what's going on. Makes sense. It's kind of like the rules for deeming someone eligible for the insanity defense. Mm -hmm. You're only eligible for that defense if you don't understand that what you did is wrong. Yes. So it's like that. John was asked during this proceeding who should take over Dunrobin Castle and the earldom from him. Mm. And he said that it should be his sister Elizabeth and her husband. Fair play. And he went further and said that their children should be heirs after them. Oh, wow. Now, according to what I read, he it says that he gave his full consent for that to happen. This is what he wanted. And everyone agreed to mm -hmm. Elizabeth and Adam taking control. But my thought is, and I don't know how you feel, if he's been deemed incompetent to manage his own affairs, why are they sealing it with his consent? Because That's... surely that means he can't give consent. Yeah. Because he can't manage his own affairs. That's what was in my head. Rather than just going off his word. I feel like someone should have been there advocating for him. Yeah. Or, like, why are they asking his opinion? I mean, ask his opinion, but you can't base everything on that. Yeah, 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 that's Especially fair. Especially on the basis of his consent. You don't want to only seek his opinion. Like, okay, yeah, you're not deemed rule. So who should? But why are you asking the actual idiot? Like, we've just got it in writing. The man's an idiot. Why are we asking him? But even just, if he's not... If he doesn't have the intelligence to understand that he's being manipulated... Oh, yeah. He can't give consent. No, that's a weird one. It was a thought I had while I was putting this together and it was just, it stuck in my head. I quite agree. Hmm. Now, what makes all of this even fishier for me is that after this was all sealed and done at court, John died a month later. Oh my God. They just got him out of the way. So he just survived long enough to make Elizabeth and Adam his successors completely legally and then he just died wow even if he did die of something not suspect unfortunate timing because <laughs> you cannot think it's suspect i mean it seems like he did have some kind of mental condition but yeah there's no indication that it was taking a toll on his health yeah his physical health and he just dies mm, don't believe that what what was that about don't believe that for a second but nothing was done like he, he died and it was all fine. What are you going to do? So in 1514, Elizabeth became the 10th Countess of Sutherland. Oh, that's our first Countess, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, so she's the first Countess. She's not the 10th Countess, mm -hmm. but it's the equivalent title to Earl. Yep. She's the 10th person to have the title. Very cool. Now, another fishy detail to me mm -hmm. is that her husband, Adam, didn't take long at all fully embracing the title of Earl of Sutherland. That he was signing off like all his letters and things with that title. Yep. He was quite happy having it and being known as the Earl of Sutherland. He wanted people to refer to him that way. Well you would be, wouldn't you? You would be, but it's it's icky. It's all mm, it's all very manipulative. It seems like he was out for his own power because he was the younger son of his father. He yeah. wasn't the eldest son. So he wasn't going to inherit his father's title. But then if we'd got married and I'd got some sort of mad impressive title, I would definitely start using it straight away. I guess, but it just seems really icky. Yeah, I know why you're saying that, but yeah, if I was suddenly the Earl of Sutherland, I'd be writing to all my friends and be like, oh yes, yours faithfully, Earl of Sutherland, <laughs> Kieran. <laughs> Except I said it wrong. Kieran, Earl of Sutherland. That's how we know you're not the Earl. That can't even say the title, right? Unfortunately, there were no titles in my family when you married me. Shit. Sorry about that. Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to Angus do? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
it's all good, right? Because Elizabeth and Adam are the Countess and Earl of Sutherland. I mean... It's guaranteed their children will inherit after them. Everything's, yep, yep. everything's fine. Depends, depends who for. It's right? Not, it's not fine for John. Every, everything's good. Everything, everything's good. Yes, for them. Life's yes, fine. Uh, 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 yes. Wrong. Uh, <laughs> is there a war coming? If you cast your mind back, mm. young Kieran, Earl of Sutherland, you might remember that I said John and Elizabeth have another brother. Mr. Gordon. No. Mr. Robert. No. No, I didn't give you his name. I just oh. told you they'd had a son and then a daughter. And then two sons. Oh, yes, yes. You remember? I remember. He's called Alexander. Mm. And he's pissed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alexander was younger than Elizabeth. He was the third of their parents' four children. Mm-hmm. But he felt that because he was, a penis. A, he was a man, that he should have inherited the earldom, not his sister. But of course. Because sexism. Yep. So he's thrown a Benny. Yeah, Alexander disputed the inheritance even though it had been settled completely legally. Yeah. He suggested that Elizabeth shouldn't be in control. He should be the Earl of Sutherland. Be- purely on the basis that he was a man. That, yep. that was it. That was his whole argument, and I, I bet it went a long way. Well, he tried it. Mm-hmm. He pursued it legally. He brought it to court. But there were lots of problems with his claim. It, it, it had so many holes. Mm-hmm. Swiss cheese. <laughs> First, he tried to claim that it wasn't safe for him to attend proceedings himself in Inverness because he feared that the Earl of Huntley would kill him. The Earl of Huntley is Adam's father. Oh. But Adam and his father both promised that no harm would come to him and Alexander was issued with a letter of safe conduct, Mm. which we've talked about before. Yep. That basically promised that no harm would come to him as he travelled to Inverness. Unless you're Douglas. Yes. At Stirling Castle. Yes. Even with this, Alexander never showed up in person. Mm. He sent a trusted man, Robert Monroe, in his stead. But one of the points that Monroe was making to try and convince the court that Alexander should be the Earl was that there was a royal charter saying that Alexander should have Sutherland lands. Uh huh. But they didn't have this charter and they couldn't prove it existed. Hmm. They tried to do a, a Book of Mormon. <laughs> yeah, so it was nothing. Yeah. They were just And he didn't even come himself no. to stake his own claim. No. I mean, at least show you're good at the job, not just that you've got a dick. No, it's just I, I want it, I deserve it. Yeah. My sister shouldn't have it. Does so... she have bowels? No. <laughs> so the jury decided that this was nothing. It was just bitching, so they ruled in Elizabeth and Adam's favour. Yeah, I can't imagine that took very long to deliberate. Well, you have all the documentation from the court with John. Yeah. Where it was decided. (laughs) Very, well, for the time, very fairly. Well, yes, I'm not saying that that was completely 100% okay, but in terms of legality Uh of the time, it was done properly. It couldn't really be debated. They followed the law at every step. Yeah, you can't really argue with that. You can try, but... So like many men who've been told they can't do or have something and are unhappy about it, Yep. Alexander effectively threw a tantrum about the whole thing. Uh, Yep, yep, saw that coming. During this time, even before Alexander staked his claim, Elizabeth and Adam had been meeting opposition from people on their lands who Mm -hmm. didn't think that they should be in charge. One of the issues with this was because Adam was a Gordon... Mm. And they didn't want the Gordons having more control in Sutherland. Fair. And as a result, they'd been reaching out to John Sinclair, who was the Earl of Caithness. Okay, yep. For help. Mm -hmm. If you remember from our Roslyn episode... I do. These are the Sinclairs who are linked to the castle and the chapel. Yes. I remembered. After I told you. No. (laughs) Not this time, usually. The Earl of Caithness basically agreed to help them. If they were attacked. So if Dunrobin were to be taken by someone, the Earl of Caithness promised to help get it back. Mm. And if it became a long fight and it seemed like it was going to be a while, the Elizabeth and Adam could take refuge in one of the Earl's properties in Caithness. So away from the fighting so they would be safe. Yep, yep, that sounds nice. Now, there's actually 
claims that before Alexander had his Benny, hmm. he fought on behalf of his sister against the Mackays. Oh. But there are other claims that say this never happened at all and the Sutherlands weren't involved in it at all. Were some of these claims from Robert Gordon? I can't remember, but weird. Weird. Because we're getting close to the point where Robert Gordon was born. Okay, yeah. So we're catching up to his actual life timeline now. Mm -hmm. After the court ruling that didn't go in Alexander's favour, favor, he launched an attack on Dunrobin Castle uh. while his sister and brother-in-law were away. Oh, they what were a in knob. Huntley at the time, in Adam's father's land, and that was when Alexander decided to take the castle because they weren't there. What a knob! I think around fifteen eighteen. So he attacked it and he seized it. He just oh. kind of stole it. Yeah, he just sort of nipped in. And held it for as long as he could. And he even had the support of the Mackays at this time. He had married into their family. Oh. That's a, that's a turnaround, isn't it? So he had their support. And he had the support of some Sutherlands uh -huh. who didn't like that Elizabeth was in charge well, like, as a woman. And yeah. didn't like that it was now in the Gordon name. That was a big issue. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth and Adam were eventually able to take the castle back. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and when they did this, Alexander fled before he could be captured. He ran away. Does he go to France and come back and start a Jacobite rebellion? He does not. <laughs> the two forces, so you have Elizabeth on one side and Alexander on the other. Their two forces met again at a place called Altnachulin. Mm -hmm. Altnachulin. Rate my pronunciation. I love it. 17 out of 10. <laughs> this battle was kind of Sutherland against Sutherland, so it was pretty painful. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people who were under the same clan now fighting against each other mm. for who should lead it. Um, but it didn't go well for Alexander. He ended up being captured by one of Elizabeth's men, but he wasn't tried or anything like that. He was executed on the battlefield. Oh, like then and there, no question. Just done. Yeah, and then his head was put on a spike, displayed outside Dunrobin Castle. As a warning. Yeah. You never really think about that now when you're visiting a castle. The heads on spikes that would have once been there. Yeah, it's it's a thing. It's a thing. It's super fun. Chill. Should we get some spikes around the house? I don't think so. <laughs> While all of this had been happening, Elizabeth and Adam had eight children. Busy. So life was continuing. Mm -hmm. And their eldest son was called Alexander Gordon. And he spent most of his life as Master of Sutherland, which was the title given to the eldest son of the Earl. Yep. Before they inherited. That makes sense. I used to like getting letters from the dentist because they said uh, Master Kieran McRae on them. <laughs> Cute. Made me feel important. That's very cute. Alexander was the one who eventually managed to bring the Mackays to heel. Mm. Um, basically forcing Alexander Sutherland's father-in-law to bend the knee. Because he had married the chief's daughter. That makes sense. Alexander Sutherland was this Alexander's uncle. Mm. Now, Alexander and his parents also had to see off another challenge to their claim... And this time it was a cousin who was descended from Kenneth de Moravia. Oh, yep, yep. Who we talked about. But they didn't have to worry too much because this challenger ended up being killed by the Bishop of Caithness <laughs> in 1530, <laughs> which I absolutely did not think was allowed. Um, these, these bishops are very violent. They're vicious. Much more violent than I ever expected a bishop to be. Absolutely vicious. No wonder they're on the chessboard wrecking shit. <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth gave up her rights to the earldom in 1527, which seems to be something that a lot of the earls did. Mm. There are fewer countesses, which is why I say that. They did that as they aged or became more infirm. They gave up the title to their children. Yeah, it's kind of retiring. That's like a bit, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, so nothing. she wasn't forced to do this. Mm -hmm. She gave up her rights, which made her son Alexander Earl of Sutherland. Mm. 
But this was very brief because he died in 1530. Mm. He died before she did. Oh. Because she lived until 1535. That's a shame. And her husband Adam lived until 1537. Oh, no. Now, Alexander, their son, was not hugely interesting. I'm just going to say it. Didn't get much of a chance to, really, did he? No. But his wife... Oh, was a very interesting woman. Oh. Who glanced off many important figures and moments in oh, yeah? Scottish history. And we're going to talk about her next time. Oh, well, that's exciting. This is kind of the halfway point. As good as I'm going to get it. Oh, so is that us for today? Yes. Is that, is that round one? Yes. Oh. Let me just bask in all that historical knowledge. My brain has just... It is a journey. This is such a packed episode. I'm really worried I've been too confusing. No, not at all. We've just been... There's been so much. Right? It's not often when we do a kind of castle episode that every generation is as interesting as the Sutherlands have been. Yeah. Because normally it's skipping a few and like here and there. It's so much. But I think it's because they had so much power. Yeah. So a lot of it is to do with who they were associating with mm-hmm. that led to what happened to them. Super interesting. Right? This is why it's two parts. This is why it's two parts. Because the second part is even better. This is like the taster session. The, we're just warming up. <laughs> Whoa. There's so much to come. We haven't even got to ghosts yet. Nope. We're doing spooking next time. Mm-hmm. I will warn that the spooking is very minor as min- part of the Dunrobin story. We can do some minimal spooking. Mm-hmm. Well, we have 500 years to traverse. Yep, we are only in 1537. Oh, put on your historical hiking boots. Mm-hmm. We got we got some distance to go yet. <laughs> I really hope you enjoy the two-parter format. Yes, I hope I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's new for us. We've only done it once. Yes. We haven't done it since, but like we said, you will now get 11 episodes this season instead of 10. Woohoo! Extra content, you! We're going to hop over to Patreon right now to record our blether. Yes, we are. That's being released on Monday, as normal. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in hearing more unscripted chat from us, head over to Patreon. Yes. We post there every week. And we've just started up a new spooky book club. We have. Which is exciting. So at the moment, we are posting on Patreon three times a week. You have the blether, you have the book club, and you have early access to our episodes. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. There's also a whole collection of extra episodes that you get like back access to. Mm-hmm. There's the whole complete first book of the book club. We read The Turn of the Screw. You can get every chapter there and listen to the whole thing. It's pretty sweet. It's great. It's great. Well, let's head over there just now. See you there. Bye. Bye.